It's my pleasure to introduce to you Mr. G. Vance Smith. Once again, it's truly wonderful to be with you here this evening. Really appreciate the opportunity to rub shoulders with great patriots. And here we're going to find some of the some of the greatest, some of the people that worked close with Mr. Welch in the early days. And it's an honor to be here. Only a few years ago, I was told, well, it's a little more than a few years ago, I was told that we didn't have a coordinator in Boston, in Massachusetts, or in New England, particularly because Massachusetts was too liberal and that we really couldn't grow here. Well, there was a major coordinator that didn't believe that. And six years ago, he hired a young man, took him away from his career, and put him to work as a coordinator in this area. And he's done a wonderful job. You're here this evening. Many of you have come from quite distance, distant places to be here. And we're grateful for that. We're grateful for the growth that's been in this area, in the surrounding area. There are many coordinators and many that have worked hard to make this evening possible. And I want to thank all of them. But I would like to spotlight this one young man that has done such an extraordinary job. Hal Shirtliff, would you please stand and be recognized? Many beginnings here. Yesterday afternoon, a number of you got to go on a tour, and I couldn't break away, but I heard from so many today what a wonderful experience that was, an emotional experience, to stand at the bridge, the Rue Bridge, where the shot fired that was heard around the world. Go to the Lexington Green and to participate in the area, in the in the history of this, of this area. It was a great feeling. But this also has another great patriotic foundation. It was here in the Belmont area that Robert Welch centered the headquarters of the John Burt Society. Belmont was known throughout America as the center of the Burt Society. And those of us out in the trenches looked at reverence, with reverence, to that Belmont office and to our leader. When Robert Welch founded the John Burt Society, we know that there was a virtual plethora of anti-communist organizations good people doing various things all over the country, and Mr. Welch knew that they couldn't be successful in defeating their enemy and preserving freedom unless they were brought together into an organization and focused. He was blessed with a genius. He was blessed with an understanding and an organizational ability, and he put together the John Birch Society and Mr. Welch was always fighting for the next five years, telling us that we had to really make things happen. And we did survive that five, and the next five, and the next five. And now, 38 years. I believe if it had not been for Mr. Welch giving us that direction and encouraging us on, we would have lost our freedoms long before now. Mr. Welch created a Ameri an Americanist organization without equal. Now, there have been since those that would copy, mimic, and sometimes just our organization, sometimes just posture and 
and take credit for the things that, that uh, the Bird Society has accomplished. And I suppose that's okay. Someone said copying or mimicking is a high form of a compliment. I do muse, though, sometimes when a newsletter writer will, as just happened in the last few days, call our friend Don Fotheringham on the phone and ask what really happened with this term limit situation. And, that, and uh, Don, I'm explain to them the various states involved, how there were once 17 states that were working toward a term limit on a ballot, got to 11, but on Tuesday only six were able to pass their bills. Well, it's going to be curious, but I can promise you that within a week or so, we'll see newsletters from this newsletter writer telling how he and his outfit brought about this great success. And uh, if they'll just, if the uh, readers will just send him more money, they'll continue to have these wonderful successes. But again, it's it's truly the fact that the Birch Society has been there has the organization and is at the helm. Mr. Welch started an organization that was unique. One reason it was unique is because it was not just simply anti-communist, nor was it simply pro-constitution, but it was an organization that understood the importance of freedom and liberty, the value of our Christian-style civilization, and recognized that there were individuals, a group of individuals that had a design to control the world, and that the only way they could be stopped were to be exposed. The John Birch Society, under Mr. Welch's leadership, said there was a conspiracy. So many of the other organizations then nor now can't even spell that word. Well, we can reflect on the past, but the truth of the matter is, it's what we do from here forward that really counts. All of those years, because of diligent efforts of members, because of their work within an educational organization to get literally millions of Americans informed to where they could act to preserve freedom in various ways, we are now in a place where we have opportunity to move forward, and we simply must do so. The enemy is not particularly original. He keeps repeating himself. Mr. Welch identified a number of the strategies. And in the 25 years that he stood at the helm, he explained those to us. And we see those strategies and tactics being repeated. Mr. Welch said regarding the strategies, among the basic weapons in the strategy of the insiders are money, prestige, war, famine, and terror. Regarding terror, he said, the terror is usually exercised in creating and maintaining the semblance of a civil war, supposedly for some worthy cause, as in China by Mao over agrarian reform, in Algeria by Ben Bella and the FLN over independence, and as intended in the United States by communist agitators over the civil rights. He made it clear that it, the use of terror was an important part of their strategy to convince people to succumb to government. We're seeing it today. It's an old strategy, but a new twist. I think it kind of 
Some things really started happening just a few years ago when Clinton was able to get the $30 billion crime bill passed. It's just too much of a coincidence that so many attacks on the conservative movement went into play. All of a sudden we saw a book, a high school textbook by James Ridgway entitled Blood in the Face. A number of individuals were sent across the country to speak to law enforcement officers, warning them of right-wing extremism. And we then were made aware of John Nutter's, quote, criminal justice and right-wing extremism in America, unquote, seminar. In May, the Christian Science Monitor <coughs> published an article by Iris, Iris Strauss, and in that article, as well as the others, it was orchestrated that the militants in America were becoming a serious threat. The right-wing extremists. That years ago, in the 60s, it was the left. But now, we're dealing with frustrated constitutionalists who are now armed with illegal weapons, taking on the tactics of an, a, a, a racist society, attacking and, in fact, bombing buildings such as the Oklahoma City Federal Center. As in the past, the media, the major media, jumps in. And many of you are aware that in, on October 14th, Dan Rather took a shot in his Monday evening program, Eye on America. We found Dan Rather inside of a holding cell in a prison interviewing a fellow named Walter Thody. Thody was a right-wing extremist, he said a man who was in prison for robbing a bank who would serve 29 years. In a few minutes of an interview, he was established as a criminal, as a racist, one stating that what happened in Oklahoma City was a good thing. Then, for the viewer, cut away from the interview, and on the screen was a black and white film clip of a chapter meeting of the John Birch Society in the early 60s. A man welcoming the group to the chapter meeting, introducing himself and saying, welcome to a chapter meeting of the John Birch Society. And then over the, over the voice, over the uh, film rather, Dan rather said these words, Thody's political awakening began in the 1960s when he joined the John Birch Society, then formed a tax protest group and progressed to counterfeiting before he began robbing banks. <coughs> Needless to say, we have no record of ever having a Walter Thody in our organization. What was happening there? In a recent uh, article in the New American, Bill Jasper elaborates. This is the uh, November 25th issue that you'll be seeing soon. Bill Jasper says, and there you have the real purpose of the CBS Blathercast. Some people refer to him as Dan Blather rather than, okay, anyway. The CBS Blathercast smearing through fabricated guilt by association. The specific target of this attack was the John Birch Society. The more general target was all those Americans who share the Birch Society's principal position to big government, socialistic government, oppressive government, world government. The purpose was to so misrepresent the JBS and like-minded Americans that they would be associated 
in the public mind with murderous terrorists and criminal fanatics. If that false association is firmly established, then virtually any kind of official action taken against these public enemies, no matter how draconian or unconstitutional, can be made to appear not only justified, but absolutely necessary. It continues. Many of you are aware that the leftist columnist Carl Rowan has now published a new book. He's being interviewed. I caught an interview the other morning on television as he was being interviewed by Brian Gumbel. This book, The Coming Race War in America, a wake-up call, tells the American people that they have got to be aware that if they do not succumb to government and total government to give up their weapons completely, and he suggests in his article that there may need to be at least two more incidents of the magnitude of the Oklahoma City bombing to make this wake-up call, but that that's what will be necessary in order to stop this terror, this terror that Robert Welch referred to as their tactic to get the American people to be willing to give up their freedoms. Well, we're aware of it. And they're gambling. They're gambling that the American people will fall for it. The truth of the matter is there are too many people that have become aware and informed over the years. And we're convinced that now if we will be aggressive and if we'll step into this battle, we can stop them. We have to understand their strategy. We have to understand what they're doing and then move forward. Their efforts are to try to eliminate the entire right wing and patriotic organizations. In doing so, they're using another tactic that Mr. Welch would bring to our attention, and that is to try to break or destroy our will to resist. It was 20 years ago that Mr. Welch said this, they are well aware of an ages-old principle which holds true in any kind of warfare. Namely, that paralyzing our will to resist by any means and to any appreciable extent constitutes a mighty victory on their road to success. What does it mean? What does all this mean? It means the John Birch Society is still considered by them to be a major threat. The different twist is that they're not attacking us specifically. They're attacking this boogeyman, the militant right wing. They're suggesting in these books and seminars and articles that the genesis or beginning of these activities was the John Birch Society and its educational organization. The threat is just that. The answer is that we have to do what we've been doing for the past 38 years only a lot more aggressively. This is a long battle. Mr. Welch said that what was going for the other side was patient gradualism. It's a challenge for us, isn't it? It's been a long fight. It doesn't move fast. It's not like the television shows, the movies, or the novels, where a problem is identified and in 90 minutes solved. Many of you in this room have been in the John Birch Society for over 30, 35 years. It's a long battle. Now what we have to do is recognize 
that the enemy is moving and moving swiftly. Our role is to be the educators. What we have done in the last several weeks is we've initiated a program for our entire membership, a call to action. We've asked our coordinators to go into their territories and get in front of every chapter, every group of members, and in fact, every individual member to make a presentation to remind them of the commitments that they've made over the years and to call them to action now because now is an extremely important time in our history. Part of that campaign is to get the American people to be aware of this issue of the magazine. This issue took several months to be planned and put together. The writers worked diligently. Gary Benoit here on the stand orchestrated a marvelous tool telling the conspiracy story in one issue of the magazine. Our goal for this next year is to see one million copies of this magazine distributed and read and then for us to realize the benefit of that awakening. We're serious about our goal. We want the members of the John Burt Society to get serious about this goal. There's a copy on each of your on the tables for each of you. If you haven't read it, please do. Please make the commitment tomorrow afternoon. It'll only take a few hours. Read this issue of the magazine, and as you do so, think of the individuals that you know, those that are already in the fight to a degree, and those that need to be informed from the beginning, and see to it that they get a copy of this magazine. Do your part. I understand that Hal and some of the coordinators have brought into the hotel here today about 50 cases. They're heavy. <laughs> Don't make them carry them back to their cars. <laughs> Each of you buy a case or two. Perhaps they'll help you carry them to the cars, but let's take this challenge seriously. Now it's not, this call to action is not simply to distribute magazines. The John Burt Society is an educational organization and we want to be benefit from this. Then you have to take the next step and follow up. Invite these people who have read the magazine to learn more about the John Burt Society. Introduce them to more books and to videotapes. Invite them into your homes. Talk to them. Help them and invite them to join the John Burt Society. We all have to do our part. Again, it's been a long battle. It's hard to stay intense in 100%. But each of us has to have to ask that question. Those of you that are members, ask yourselves, when's the last time I systematically worked to bring someone into the John Burt Society? Ask yourself. We might hear in someone's head, I joined in 1980 or 76 or whatever, and I did a lot of the recruiting early on, but maybe I really haven't been doing much of that lately. It's time again. It's time. Ask yourself, if I were to invite someone to join the John Burt Society, do I even have an application? for membership that I could take from my pocket or purse and give to that individual? Or would I have to chase down my coordinator or chapter leader to do it? We want to solve that problem for you, too. Out on the table this evening, there are stacks of applications for membership. 
stop by and pick up three or four. Keep them on you. Set goals. I've learned that nothing really happens if we don't plan and set goals. Set the goal to recruit at least one new member this year. Well, there's a little over a month and a half left. That's not an impossible task. Then set the goal to bring another member in the first six months of next year. Set the goal. Work toward that goal. It will amaze you what you can accomplish and what you will accomplish if you do. We need to grow. We need to apply that understanding that we all agreed with when Mr. Welch said we need more pullers at the oars, not just passengers in the boat. Now, if you're wondering who you're going to sign up into the John Burt Society, let me make a couple of suggestions. Who do you love the most? Who's nearest and dearest to you? Who would you like to make certain had their freedoms and their liberties? Chances are it's going to be members of your own family, your children, your companions, your grandchildren. We can't be, we can't think we're being kind by staying out of their lives with this information when in fact they're the ones that have gleaned from you the importance of the battle in which you're involved. If we don't invite our own family and closest friends into the Burt Society, who will? In a few minutes, we've talked about a battle that Mr. Welch identified as a war against of good and evil. The enemy, Mr. Welch described as a satanic conspiracy. We've identified our responsibilities of individuals to stand up and to oppose that conspiracy. It does exist. As difficult as it is for some people to want to talk about, it does exist. It's easy to prove. And we must admit it's there and deal with it. As individuals, we have a challenge and a responsibility. Again, it's what we do in the future that really counts. The truth of the matter is, freedom has been preserved because there have been a lot of people working at it, but also, as our motto indicates, it's happened because of God's help. And I hope we know that. I hope we understand that that we can only do our part, but ultimately, if we're going to succeed, it will be with the help of God. It's not a new thought. George Washington said it. The success which has hitherto attended our united efforts, we owe to the gracious interposition of heaven. And to that interposition, let us gratefully ascribe the praise of victory and the blessings of peace. Alexander Hamilton said, the, right, the sacred rights of mankind are not to be rummaged from among old parchments or musty records. They are written by the hand of divinity itself. Thomas Jefferson said, the God who gave us life gave us liberty at the same time. And John Quincy Adams from the day of the Declaration, the American people were bound by the laws of God and by the laws of the gospel, which they nearly all acknowledged as the rules of their conduct. The future is ours. 
The challenge is ours. The task is immense. We're a David standing against a monstrous Goliath. If we strive, however, we can succeed. We have been handed the baton from those before us. We are the heirs of ages past. The great patriots, Washington, Madison, Jefferson, Patrick Henry, Robert Welch, they've done their part. Now it's up to us, the members of the John Birch Society, the other patriots across this country, those who have been informed, those who need to be with us, it's up to us. And there's no one else to do it. I can't see that any other organization, religious or secular, that is stepping forward to fight this battle. I can't see it. We have to do it. Let's accept the challenge. Let's do all in our power to bring about less government, more responsibility, and with God's help, when and because we deserve it, a better world. Thank you very much.